I was uh, in the fifth grade when I was given my first Bible. And that was nearly 50 years ago, back in the days when schools still allowed members of the Gideon Society evangelists to come into public school classrooms and hand out Bibles and deliver them with little sermons. Because it was 50 years ago, what they gave us was a King James Version of the New Testament with the Psalms. It was delivered with a story that the Gideons have told in many different versions for nearly a hundred years. A soldier was given a Gideon New Testament and he carried it next to his heart inside his jacket. And one day when he and his fellow troops were under fire and his comrades were being killed on both sides of him, a bullet hit him in the chest and thankfully it hit right where his New Testament was and like a molten lead finger it pierced the pages right up to Psalm 91 where it says a thousand shall fall at thy side ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee. These stories are told by adults to children both to frighten them and to indoctrinate them. We were left to assume that the soldiers who failed to carry their New Testaments were godless people who were killed on the battlefield. They wouldn't have been killed if they'd been more faithful. The Bible carried a certain magic with it that undergirded the claim that not only God had written it and everything about it was true, but that it somehow touched on the divine and you needed to stay in constant contact with it. Now, some of you have heard me tell the story before, but I'm also very fond of Woody Allen's version of this in which he said that he grew up in a very rough neighborhood where his mother took a rifle shell and made a necklace out of it that he could wear under his shirt to give him courage. And that he, he said that one day it actually saved his life when a crazed Gideon threw a Bible at him and it would have gone right through his heart. But it was stopped by that bullet. But in the world in which many of us grew up, there was an assumption that the Bible was God's word. And we went to Sunday school for years trying to understand it. And several of us went on to college to study it, paying intense attention to the minutia of translation. We studied Greek and Hebrew and ancient Near Eastern history, trying to unlock all of the magical mysteries of the text. The more conservative among us tried every kind of logical gymnastic to make all of the weird and embarrassing parts fit together somehow and explain them so that they made sense in a divine whole. The more progressive were willing to focus on what we came to call a canon within the canon. That is, we focused on the more plausible, the more agreeable, the more useful parts of the Bible, and we interpreted everything out from that. We had our favorite passages where we took our stand and defined everything else based on its agreement with those texts. For decades, many of us put on what amounted to a Kelly and Conway attitude and tried to insist that the Bible didn't really say that, that Paul didn't really mean that, and that these hard passages were really just taken out of context, that they were misunderstood or misinterpreted. Look, folks, I think it's time to get real. The Bible praised Jephthah for sacrificing his daughter in honor of a battlefield pledge. The Bible told the children of Israel to wipe out, slaughter the Midianites, except for the young women who hadn't had sex yet. And it demanded the stoning of people who have done things that most of you did before you got here today. The Bible really says those things. When we encounter a text like the one that we sort of read today from 1 Peter, a text that sums up the core of evangelical Christianity, saying that we have been saved from eternal damnation by the blood sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, 
Many of us with more progressive leanings were taught in seminary to say, well, substitutionary death is one of the perspectives in the Bible, but there are many other perspectives. We have alternative interpretations of the meaning of the death of Jesus. We would say that the scriptures speak in many different voices from many perspectives, and so we try to marginalize texts like this one, push them to the side, and focus on other passages that are more helpful, more relevant, more acceptable to our modern views. But what I was not willing to say for the first two decades of my professional career, what I'm still waiting to hear from most of my peers, is that in very many cases, the theology we encounter in the Bible is just wrong. It's just wrong. We don't have to justify it. We don't have to explain it away. We don't have to find another way to interpret it. We should be able to stand up on our own two feet and say, yeah, I don't believe that. It's just not right. For many of us who grew up with a giant version of the Bible sitting on an olive wood stand in, in the living room on the coffee table, and with, for me at least, a Gideon New Testament in the hip pocket of my Levi's, those of us who went to Sunday school every week, who went to college Bible studies, and especially for those of us that went to seminary and beyond, saying that the Bible has bad theology, and it was saying a bit more than we could make ourselves say. You could study it, dissect it, interpret it, argue with it, but to publicly say, look, the Bible says a whole lot of stuff that if you took it seriously would really be psychologically damaging, could really hurt you. That was a bridge too far for a long time. Now, not all scholars are going to agree on this point, but I am persuaded that all of the New Testament was written in conversation with the core letters of the Apostle Paul. Everyone agrees that Paul wrote his core letters before any other part of the New Testament was, was written, but still, Paul's letters to the churches in Corinth, Rome, Galatia, and Philippi formed the earliest definition, interpretation of what it meant to be Christian. The Gospels, which give us the best source of Jesus' material, were all written under an umbrella, a theological assumption that we had to square the Jesus story with Paul before we squared the Jesus story with Jesus. The other Catholic epistles sometimes offered certain departures from Paul's view, but they didn't give themselves a lot of license to entirely disagree. They, they disagreed more in nuanced tones than in the fundamental core of Paul's theology. Paul lived in the last days of the Jewish temple. He was executed in Rome uh, about a decade before the temple was destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The whole aspect of Judaism as an animal sacrifice cult was already passing out of existence even in the time of Jesus. The, 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 there, when you talk about Judaism, you have to talk about three or four Judaisms, but there was a period of time in which the Jewish religion was centered on a temple, priesthood-centered, animal sacrifice religion. But there, even in the time of Jesus, there were synagogues being built that had a different kind of teacher, that had rabbis that were not members of the priesthood, and that showed fairly little allegiance to the temple. There were independent forms of Judaism already forming before the temple was destroyed. In Paul's mind, the Jesus whom he never met, because the Jewish faith was about to end under Roman occupation and, and under Greek influence, that Jesus represented a way for Judaism to change so that it had a future. What Jesus said, what Jesus believed in, what motivated Jesus to actually go up to Jerusalem and put himself in harm's way leading to his execution, all of those details were of no interest to Paul. For Paul, Jesus was what we call an eschatological figure. He was a... Uh, uh, an individual who changed history, that moved us from one period of human history into a final period of human history, a sacrifice that ushered in a new age. Realistically, the religion of Paul 
had virtually nothing to do with the historical Jesus. Now there's a great deal to praise about the Christian religion, both historically and in our present day. There's a great deal even to praise about the genius of Paul, who influenced the shaping of Western society, dare I say it, much more than Jesus did. I mean, we, we don't know a lot about Jesus. What we know about is Paul. And Paul's thinking that in many ways set Western civilization on the track that it has followed into modernity. But the Christian religion is, if I can sum it up this way, an invention of Paul and had very little to do with Jesus. Jesus, historically, might have been, I don't even know this for sure, but he might have been a radically anti-empire reformer whose beliefs the empire needed to snuff out as quickly as possible. But Paul offered a religion that not only did not threaten the empire, it was in fact quite useful to the empire. The Christian faith, according to Paul and the Catholic epistles, taught personal piety, a confident faith in an afterlife, and in none too subtle terms, obedience to the state. And as it is interpreted in this passage we read from 1 Peter, it taught you that you need to be afraid of God, to live, as, as this text says, in reverential fear, and that your redemption from a very, very bad outcome on Judgment Day was based on the sacrifice of the innocent life of Jesus Christ. Literally, he is affirming what I've said to you before, you are so bad that God had to kill himself. We were taught to believe in a God who was concerned with the minutia, not only of how you reproduce, but even of what kind of food you eat and what kind of clothing you wear and what days you work and what days you don't. The God of our Sunday school classes was worse than Santa Claus. Santa Claus knew whether you were naughty or nice for just a few weeks before Christmas. But the God of the Hebrew Bible and of the Christian New Testament watched us all the time. One of my favorite passages of scripture is found in the book of Job, chapter 7, verse 19, where Job's friends have been trying to convince him that all the bad things that have happened to him have happened because God knows. Job can't think of any terrible sins that he's done, but his friends are telling him, God knows. God watches you. God knows your private sins. And God rejects this hyper-judgmental God and screams at the sky, would you mind turning your head so I can swallow my spit? That, that you ought to be able to just have some aspect of your personal life that's not constantly being watched. Now that's a colorful way of saying it uh, in the ancient world. But what the poet who wrote Job is saying is that a God who is that watchful, who is that judgmental, doesn't even deserve our respect. That God is a monster. That God is like the NSA. We don't want that. If religion has a lasting value in a scientific age, surely it must represent a passionate search for what is true, not what is imaginary. A lot of what you read in the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, and, and dare I say in the Quran, could be said to be offering us certain moral correctives to our narcissistic and greedy tendencies. I mean, there are ways in which our appetites can run over us. And so these ancient scriptures are hoping to corral our less civilized aspects, but they, they also bear with them the seeds of some serious mental illness. Clearly, while I object to the neurotic guilt that is present in much of traditional religions, we all know some folks who could stand a good dose of conscience. I mean, they really would benefit from a little more concern about their behavior. Our governor here in Missouri shouldn't be able to sleep at night for, for not being willing to expand Medicaid coverage to give health care to the poor. That, that's not something you should be comfortable with. Bill Cosby, Roger Ailes, Bill O'Reilly, could stand to feel a little more personal guilt. 
some shame, some remorse. And our president, who came out very quickly to say that he didn't believe Bill O'Reilly did anything wrong, which I think that the real crux of that issue could, could be a slight rewording of that sentence, that Trump doesn't believe that what Bill O'Reilly did was wrong, which is really different. He's not saying that he was innocent of the charges. He's saying, yeah, he did those things and he ought to be allowed to because rich white conservatives ought to be able to treat women that way. So you see, guilt is not always neurotic. We have a conscience for a reason. I just think healthy spirituality should train our conscience to be honest, to promote health and truth. Somewhere between the narcissism of these public figures who seem to assume that no moral rules apply to them and the cowering supplicant who is crippled with neurotic guilt, there is an honest and true path that is healthy and helpful. Lewis Black claims that Jews created guilt, Catholics codified it, and Protestants turned it into just tension, constant tension. All of our world religions could stand to be updated with a dose of modern psychological sophistication. God does not keep a list of sins, nor is there any reasonable sense that anyone owes a blood debt to God. There is no final judgment, unless it's the judgment that comes every day. There, there is a need for good judgment, moment by moment. Not an end of time or end of life judgment, but a thoughtful aware, decisive way of choosing the better path over the destructive path. Now sin, if I may be allowed to talk about sin, we almost need a closed pen for that part of the conversation, but, but sin is a social construct. If you're living on an island by yourself out in the tropics, there is no sin. There, there's, sin is only when avoidable harm is done to another person. But even what is and is not a social ill or a social blessing, those things are not constant. Those, those values are constantly changing. And so a, a sincere spiritual person has to keep asking what is right today. And, and society changes. Hopefully society is growing more and more empathetic in that we are not dismissive of people because of their race anymore. We're not dismissive because of their language or their religion or their sexual orientation. But that uh, progress doesn't always go in a straight line, folks. If November 8th didn't teach us anything else, it certainly affirms that progress doesn't always go in a straight line. You sometimes take two or three steps back, but that doesn't call for surrender. Religion has often burdened society with horribly ill-informed sexual guilt. Repression often leads to sexual perversion rather than the intended goal of, of religious conservatives, which would be sexual abstinence. A healthy spirituality should promote a healthy sexuality. But understanding what is and what is not healthy is a topic that requires constant revision. Muhammad married a very young girl. And, and you could say in the days of Muhammad, that was acceptable or normal. But I can tell you even peers criticized Muhammad for marrying such a young girl. So society will question whether polygamy is acceptable or not, whether uh, the age of legitimate consent. I, I find it very strange that we have these time points where one of the young men that I'm going to be visiting in prison is in prison because he had naked pictures of a girlfriend who was two years younger than him. He was 18 and she was 16. That seems like kind of a fine distinction. If she'd been 18, she could go into the pornography industry. I mean, we've got some nervous issues here. At When my daughter was 
20 years and 11 months old, if I'd poured a glass of wine for her in our own home, that would have been a criminal act on my part. But on her 21st birthday, her sorority sisters could take her on a tour of local bars, and it was legal to make my poor child sick, which they did. Uh, <laughs> We're constantly having to question what are the boundaries between free, liberated life and social responsibility. And as much as I want churches, mosques, and synagogues to come into the 21st century, if Donald Trump makes another sexual comment about his daughter, I'm willing to go all medieval on him and, and bring back public stoning of perverts. But most of us in the 21st century have come to the conclusion that sex between consenting adult partners is not a sin. But it's quite clear that people like Trump, Ailes, O'Reilly, and especially Bill Cosby don't understand what consent means. And even when there is adult consent, there are social and health concerns that should be a part of an informed conscience. We should respect the exclusive promises that couples generally make to one another in marriage. We should respect that vow and not try to interfere with it. We should be concerned about taking precautions against spreading diseases or causing unplanned pregnancies. But we absolutely should not teach young men and women to loathe their own bodies or to feel guilt for their very normal and natural desires. The Catholic Church must come out of the 16th century and reconsider this whole celibate priesthood thing. Could they possibly still be gathering evidence for the fact that a celibate priesthood leads to all kinds of sexual misconduct? That it doesn't work that way. Islam must stop pretending that they are not, as they are living it out, a misogynistic faith. They don't have to be, and they haven't always been. But there is growing pressure on women in Muslim countries to cloak their bodies in a way that implies sexual guilt for simply being female. And Protestants who still promote these abstinence-only programs, and especially their psychologically cruel exodus programs, they've just got to take a modern scientific course on human reproduction and stop with your silly, uninformed guilt and fear that is creating so many horrible, sexually perverted and criminal people. Now I want to respect the faiths of all other people, but I also want other faith communities to be respectable. And in our scientific and medically and psychologically aware age, any religion that still condemns homosexuality or that wants to treat women as being somehow either inferior to or personally responsible for the sexual urges of men, or any religion that leads you to believe that you are inherently evil so that you must live in fear of divine judgment. Folks, that religion doesn't deserve our respect. We don't have to act like we tolerate that. An illumined spiritual life joyfully embraces the fruit of scientific discovery, both in what we know and what we do not yet understand. Still, we commit to live out the claim that love is our religion. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.